Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the Global Earthquake DAS Data Campaign Coordination Meeting. I'm Casey Adderhold, Project Associate at Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. Use of distributed acoustic sensing is rapidly expanding in our community, prompting the initiation of a research coordination network to facilitate workshops, tutorials, and other opportunities for sharing ideas and resources. This coordination meeting will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science webinar YouTube channel. Should you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, please clearly and concisely type into the Q&A box, not the chat box, on your Zoom control panel. At the end, we'll read your name and questions to the presenters. If similar questions have been asked, we may combine or skip them. If the webinar happens to crash due to Zoom or internet issues, we will reboot it. Just click the webinar link again. Auto automatic captions will be available to be turned on and off on your Zoom control panel. If you would like to ask or make a comp, sorry, ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. We will give you permission to unmute and turn on video. I'm going to pass this um, on to Andreas Wusterfeld, lead of the DAS RCN Working Group on Research and Development Test Sites, to present an, an introduction and then moderate the rest of this section, uh, session. Thanks, Andreas. Want to go ahead and share screen? Yes, uh, thanks, Casey, very, very much for the, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, coordination meeting. Um, it's been uh, very interesting to, to get all the feedback. Uh, initially, when, when this idea came up in the uh, DAS RCN, uh, I was hoping for five, maybe 10 groups around the world to join. And uh, I think the latest number I got was 116 participants in this meeting. So uh, it shows really that there's an interest in, the, in this kind of uh, global monitoring. Uh, also here in the uh, in the group team we have uh, Herb Wang, who is uh, I, I think leader of the of the DAS RCN in general. We have uh, Woon Hui Lai, uh, who is leading the uh, or you know, working in the DAS uh, format and metadata team, and uh, Jonathan Ajo Franklin, who is today here. Uh, well, he has many. Uh, roles as well, but today he is helping here with moderating of the question and answer session. So without further ado, I'm now trying to share my screen. Share and the PowerPoint. So that is shared, right? Okay, wonderful. Looks great. So uh, the Global DAS Monitoring Month of 2023, or the DAS Month, uh, that's uh, slightly easier to pronounce. Uh, so the background. So uh, I'm a seismologist by background, and I was always amazed uh, kind of to read by all these seismometers placed around the world. And Iris USGS was very instrumental in helping setting that up globally. Um, the aim was to better understand the Earth, uh, but it was also driven by the needs of uh, to locate nuclear tests. Um, that's actually still what we are doing here at NOSAR uh, in, in Oslo. That's uh, our, our background as well. But in general, we need uh, global uh, stations to, to better understand the Earth. Um, the challenges at the time included the cost of inst uh, instrumentation, cost of installation. Uh, the data transmission rate, as you can imagine, back in the 60s wasn't that high. So, and also the data format. So the idea now of, uh, of using DAS systems uh, as a global seismometer network is to come up with the next generation um, of global instrument network uh, there's been a rapid increase of dust installations recently, and uh, more and more uh, research institutes have interrogators readily available, and there are also commercial installations. So the challenges right now include for a global seismometer network, it's again the cost of instrumentation, the cost of installation, data transmission rate, albeit on a slightly different scale, 
uh, data format. Uh, and it's also about uh, data sharing. So can all the data be shared openly? And uh, a major point is uh, what I got in feedback from discussing uh, in emails with uh, quite a few people uh, ahead of this call was the uh, sensitivity of cable coordinates. Uh, lots of the commercial installations, uh, they, there are restrictions on how openly can cable coordinates be shared. So that is something that uh, needs to be considered. So the DAS month has the stated aim to uh, identify bottlenecks that might obstruct a fiber optic global seismometer network. So it's really just to find out what do we need to do to plan ahead for a more permanent system. So that's why we have just one month and to find out how this all works. Uh, and then a, with the lessons learned, we can then move on. But we can then also have secondary objectives because this will be a very interesting data set. So we can collect dust data globally during the same period and do great science with it, hopefully. So if we have multiple uh, dust data sets of various lengths from around the world at the same time, I'm pretty sure some interesting stuff will come out. Um, also, we need to advance then the common data format efforts and uh, a bit more on the, I don't want to say boring bit, but on the, on the hardworking bit, uh, it's uh, to develop policies for data sharing. And, uh, but also it's about learning about the available infrastructure, who has what available around the world and what are they working with. So uh, this will be uh, also very interesting. Uh, I call it here the light motif or the theme of the campaign is this is a purely voluntary effort. There's no if you um, yeah, if you commit now and then later on find out that your data cannot be shared due to some reasons uh, or the cable is broken, interrogator fallout. There's absolutely no no problem with that. We are happy about every contribution that is uh, there. So no no hard feelings i guess it's also community driven so i want to keep that as low profile and low effort as possible um we have no central qc so whatever you upload it's your responsibility uh, that it's readable for everybody and useful for everybody um and in doubt keep it simple just don't overthink things, just keep it simple and uh, think about how you would want to receive data. Um, so yes, I think just keep it, uh, keep it simple. Frequent questions I got uh, in email after inviting people. So uh, when, what, how, where, and what format? So I will go through these questions uh, briefly and I hope uh, we can answer that all just put in uh, questions in the uh, in the Q&A box. So how? We want to share uh, global earthquakes uh, and I defined here magnitude five as a minimum threshold uh, as reported by USGS. So. I expect that to be around 150 events per month. So that's the rough estimate uh, of uh, on an average month. That's the number of magnitude five and greater events that happen. Um, so there's the idea of a daily updates of an online document to provide a, a catalog, but also people can just go through to the USGS website where there is links, I do have a slide of that later. Um, so data owners, which is you, uh, can then decide to upload data directly or at the end of the campaign, uh, more details to the upload location comes later, uh, later in this presentation also. Um, also, it would be great if you have a, a readme.txt in a 
just in a text format. So it uh, can be read on any computer around the world, on a mobile phone, whatever, um, with the name of the organization, contact information. Uh, think about that this data will be available in the very long-term future. So maybe use a generic email address like info at company.com or dustteam at university.org. Um, just so that it's not fixed to one person alone. Um, also general information about the cable, geology and so forth. So anything you have. And Woon will uh, later present a bit more on, on the uh, extended uh, metadata format that they have suggested. So this will all still be, there are still some kinks in, the, in these ideas. Uh, but we, I'm sure we will find that uh, figure that out until February. So this is the uh, a screenshot of the USGS uh, website. I'm sure lots of you know that already. Um, so they provide lots of different uh, options to get access to their catalog, also in in real time or near real time. So um, if you want to integrate that into your uh, software on the interrogator to uh, directly uh, cut out the, uh, the windows from the earthquakes, this is probably the best way to do that, to access the USGS feed. Um, so we envision, or we plan, I guess, to use the Pub DAS server. We are currently having a, a paper uh, under review on the Pub DAS server. This is a University of Michigan uh, initiative. They have uh, more than, uh, Herb, is it correct? 300 terabyte of data space available, of which uh, currently 90 terabytes are used. And uh, so this is using uh, Globus Connect, which is a web service. And I uh, naively compare that to a much more modern FTP service. Um, so you basically have a way to asynchronously upload and download uh, data to that service through a special protocol. Uh, it is rather straightforward to set up. Um, so um, we will share more information about that later as well. Uh, so currently on the PubDAS server, there are nine data sets. Uh, many of you know these already, it's been published data, but there are data, uh, these data will be free av available for, for download. And uh, maybe I can just copy that link in the in the chat, or maybe Jonathan, you have the uh, the DOI uh, also available and paste it in the in the chat. Uh, sure. Well, let me check. Um, so that would be then also good, so people get a feeling for how that uh, pop does actually works and what's the idea. Um, so the idea is that everybody can then upload their uh, data sets into a separate folder on that service. Um, initially, we I envisioned that to be a 30, no, three terabytes. If we assume 10 cables with 10 kilometers uh, and 150 events, with the data space that I came up later, uh, or with the specifications that will be mentioned in a, in a second. So that should be three terabytes. Um, if we end up with 30 terabytes, the system can also handle that. So yes. So that's globus.org. Uh, please have a look at that website as well to get accustomed to that. And uh, Zach Speaker is uh, in charge of that at the University of Michigan from the DAS site. So we, we will sort that out. 
Okay, coming back to the questions, when it has been arbitrarily chosen to use February 1st to February 28th, just because it's a nice round four week month. Um, and it's after the Christmas period where everybody should then be back. So there's no real reason why that is has been chosen. Um, Again, data owners can then upload their data directly or at the end of the campaign. Um, at the moment, I envision that the data portal upload will close at the end of March, just so that we have then the opportunity to have a full overview at the end of March uh, of what is available for that month. Exceptions will always be possible, of course, but aim for uh, 31st of March. Um, there will be also dissemination of the results. I aim for an EGU abstract, an EGU presentation. So that's also helpful then for making figures and statistics. So if you upload it after 31st of March, you won't be included in the, in the publication. Oh yes, so this is the uh, a map from the USGS, just what was recorded this February. So 140 earthquakes happened this, 140 earthquake magnitude five happened this February. So this gives a, hopefully a good representation of events around the, the world. Um, Unsurprisingly, lots of events coming from Tonga, but uh, as a seismologist, we know all of that already. And uh, I'm pretty sure there will be some interesting events. We all hope for the big magnitude eight event somewhere deep and somewhere non-destructive. So what to share now? Uh, we want to share time windows of uh, magnitude five earthquakes. As I said, a time window is one hour per event. So 3,600 seconds after the origin time as recorded as reported by the USGS. So we have 3,600 seconds of data from your dust system. Um, Downsample to 100 Hertz, just to keep data size uh, manageable, but still have the uh, interesting frequency range. Uh, and everything should be converted already to strain rate data just to make life easier for everybody downloading it and processing the data. So strain rate is the um, unit of choice here. Spatial sampling also to keep the data size manageable should be larger than 20 meters. Um, for global earthquakes, um, we don't need more than 20 meters. If you have coarser, that's fine. But if you have finer, I think it would also be nice just to downsample it to keep data size manageable. Um, and we do need the uh, cable or the channel coordinates in lat long elevation. So, and that implies that the data also already um, calibrated. So any loops are taken out or um, yeah, if you have top tests with the data, they, uh, uh, you need to correct the data with that just because there's no way for other people working with your data to afterwards correct for that. So please upload the calibrated data with lat long. <clears throat> Uh, the data will be under Creative Commons license. So uh, please check with everybody who might have uh, interest in the data that these data can actually be shared. Um, that's also why we have just windowed data. So it's not continuous data. So um, there is less like in commercial project, there's often uh, problems with sharing continuous data, but one hour windows should be fine. But the uh, question is again, uh, cable coordinates, that's often a problem in my experience. Um, I have also created a form 
an office form, uh, which I will also put the link in, in the chat or in the Q&A here later for everybody to see, uh, to fill out. It has general questions like just where do you want to have your installation? Which part of the world are you? Um, uh, the cable length and uh, installation type. So do we have a downhole or pipeline or train or whatever? Um, so, okay, this, uh, yes, I will answer your question, Manfred, in a, in a second. Um, <clears throat> the file format, um, has been, or there has been the Iris Dust RCN working group has been working extensively on uh, on a metadata model, and uh, Woon will uh, present on that more in a, in a second. Uh, for data sharing, we currently envision a very simplistic uh, HDF file format which uh, has just the very basic limited um, data information. So just the traces in strain rate and uh, header informations with uh, time zero, uh, sampling rate, channel lat long elevation. Um, and then any additional information can be put into a flexible extended header. And then all files will be stored in a um, in uh, yes, in just files that start uh, with a with a certain uh, format. Um, this uh, yeah details will be shared uh, during October as well. We still need to agree on a few uh, smaller things, and then we will also prepare a reference reader. So you can export your data then and test it against the reference reader. So just to be sure that uh, everything is up to specs. And I think this was it. So uh, Manfred has a question here. Can you please elaborate on what findings one could typically expect in mixing simultaneous distributed dust data during a major earthquake? Um, the idea is to have just global events from from yeah or multiple stations around the, the world with dust and you can have then i think the, the wave field if you have uh, yeah changes in the wave field um a, along a cable path and to look at it in like i don't know if you have a cable in spain and then in southern france uh, how does the effect of the um, uh, the Pyrenees affect that? I don't know, uh, but I think in in general it's a, the global um, monitoring campaign. Just what can you actually do? I'm not sure if there's any specific question we can answer. Uh, maybe Jonathan, you want to chime in there? I mean, I think one interesting question which might be answerable is using kind of beam forming in these different arrays to improve detection thresholds, especially for fives, for example, located on the other side of the world. Um, and so having a variety of different types of DAS arrays in different environments allows you to kind of uh, potentially tackle that question. I think there's still interesting questions having to do with dynamic range and array response, which also might be good to tackle as part of this type of study. Um, and then I'm actually interested in array to array kind of uh, cross correlation analysis. And I don't know if uh, Andreas is, is going to mention this, but uh, we're hoping to kind of maybe connect up a subset of us who are willing to kind of contribute continuous data as well for, uh, for at least one day to try some experiments with that. Um, that's not part of the main effort here, but uh, it would be another interesting question to potentially tackle. Yes, uh, good points. Uh, so yes, the, the array processing is definitely uh, of interest, uh, kind of make an array of arrays. Um, and uh, also the idea of having one specific day of where 24 hours basically are shared 
but that also uh, depends on then on the data size. So we will, that's what the questionnaire is, uh, is considered. Uh, maybe before we continue with the Q and A, maybe just uh, Boone can present something on the, uh, on the metadata. Um, sure. It will be a sh pretty short presentation, but we just want to sort of show what the RCN group has been doing. Let me just get to the slides. Apologies. I hope everyone can see the slides. Yes, it looks great. Yes. Lovely. So, um, the dust uh, management group has been meeting um, sort of semi regularly over the last uh, one year. Uh, and it's the group led by Rob Mellis, who uh, apologizes that he can't be joining us today. And then, um, so some of the questions that we're trying to tackle was the dust data volume is big. There is no common metadata standard currently. So, what are the needs for it? And then, what are the challenges that we're facing? And uh, before I go on uh, with the presentation, just like to thank Iris and also um, and also two other um, institutions, uh, Australian Research Data Commons and also National Computational Infrastructure. They're both based in Australia that has provided a lot of technical support in terms of how to move forward with metadata. So a need for a common dust metadata standard. Uh, we understand that there is a growing dust experiment and data volume in terabyte scale. There is a push from a lot of journals and pub, uh, um, publishers to share data publicly in a fair standard. And we can see that with the growing number of experiments, and uh, it's not surprising that we also have a growing number of publication. And then with the increasing number of dust providers, we have a lot of uh, with different conventions on how to write their headers. We're trying to find a way to sort of make it uh, a standard that uh, end users like scientific researchers like us are able to access all these different types of DAS data. So sort of like in the group, uh, we thought of like the main two challenges in sharing DAS data set. Number one is there's no standard data or metadata format presently for DAS. Number two, the dust volumes are pretty large and it exceeds sort of your traditional seismic data repositories. So for this particular metadata group, we're trying to focus on just challenge number one. So some of the reason is behind is that the common seismic data formats currently is not a good fit for dust data set. And some of the first steps uh, we're working towards um, a common dust data metadata reporting format. And some of these are some of the first steps. So we're trying to capture sort of the technical requirements. We are not specifying a specific format. So we're not saying that it has to be in um, XLS or XML, or JSON or HDF5, for example. But then this, whatever format that is being used should follow fair principles, which means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but what does fair principles really mean? So, so we uh, thought of it in five different ways. So it has to be broad. So this metadata format should accommodate most types of dust data collection scenarios. So we have boreholes, uh, and we have active source surveys in uh, either dark fiber or direct uh, fiber that was deployed by ourselves. There's continuous data set, there's offshore data. So this format should be able to accommodate all of these scenarios. It should be accessible. So this format um, and information should be in a non-proprietary format. It's uh, discoverable. So it should be easy to find and interpreted by humans and computers. And then especially by computers so that we can do indexing and be able to search on or different servers to find sort of like what we have with seismic data sets. We can look for them with a standard uh, attribute. It's reusable. So what we've meant by reusable is that 
this metadata information should be enough for people who are not the one deploying the data to use this information without contacting the original authors and can be reused uh, in 10 years time, 20 years time. And then lastly, sort of, uh, we use the word uh, agile. So this format should be easily adoptable with new processing techniques or new uh, archiving techniques. So we're thinking of like, this format should be easy to transport for cloud-based processing, real-time processing, for example. So uh, as many of, the, uh, of you have deployed uh, DAS, um, have maybe have some idea what the structure is. So we're not, not too far off from that. There's basically five different uh, blocks. So we have the first block is an overview, which gives sort of like a high level overview of the dust deployment. So who's doing it, what, where, why is it? And then there are some of the attributes that we identify as required. So there's like things like location, deployment time, is it continuous, is it temporary? Network name, for example, start time, end time. So next in the second level, you have sort of cable and fiber. So this is used to identify the fiber that is actually being used in dust measurement. So some of the required info will be the ID, the cable coordinates, and the optional info will be like so cable characteristics, how is it being installed, fiber refraction index, fiber length, winding angle for borehole measurements. So you have the next level is interrogator itself. So information of the interrogator, interrogator use. So there could be multiple interrogator that's plugged into the same fiber, but then they could have different manufacturer, for example. Acquisition, so different interrogator. Even with the same interrogator, you can have very different photonic setup. You change the gauge length, for example, or change the spatial sampling, or the final time series that is being saved is uh has uh, uh some signal processing steps has been done on it so this information will be captured by the attributes and then last but not least is the individual channel so you have the channel id you have the reference frame for how the location is being reported and then some of which uh within the group we're trying ideas of like how to make it a bit less um uh of the information heavy so we're thinking of using pointer to point all these different information for coordinates, for example. So these are sort of the proposed meta, uh, metadata structure. And then all these are listed in detail with our current efforts. So in the over the last one year, the DAS RCM Working Group has written up the first version of a white paper. So here's sort of like a screenshot of the paper itself. So um, Andreas showed a July version. Now we have an August version. And um, what is uh, unique about uh, this white paper is that not only we list out all the different metadata, but we also try to apply it in three case scenario where the data are publicly available. So we have Safford, which is uh, in the borehole measurement in San Andreas Fault. We have um, sort of an active source survey. Um, at the Nary Levy in Texas, I think. And then they have, lastly is the Porotomo project. And um, this white paper uh, was presented in the previous EGU conference and then some feedback has been collected. But then in the word document, it's, a, it's pretty hard to get feedback and also sort of share the information. So we're currently working on putting it on GitHub as, a way to do version control. So this is uh, sort of uh, it's currently in my own private repo, but we plan to move it to DAS RCN once we've uh, sold out all those licensing issues. And then this GitHub, um, we version control, we try to follow the recommended practices developed by other um, group. And there's a wonderful paper that was published in Earth and Space Science uh, last year where provided a lot of good advices on how to um, standardize sort of issue um, and also getting people, um, providing templates for prov uh, giving suggestions, for example. And uh, some of you might be familiar with GitHub. They're not the most reader friendly. So we're also trans putting, uh, pushing all the uh, information on GitHub to GitBook, which is 
serves like a web page where you can click on different metadata and get information. So for example, here is an overview metadata. You have your location. So you have an attribute ID. So this is sort of the ID that you'll see in, uh, in your software or code or wrapper script. And it has different definition. And then we provide an example. This is for Safford. And then this is a required information. Then you have a so a different example with a cable environment, which is an optional attribute. We have a, as well as definition, and then we have a control vocabulary where you can choose different options. And with control vocabulary, it makes it easy to search when we have a database. So as a whole. This is a first effort to define metadata requirement and build a model that is uh, to capture what is needed for fair purposes. Now, of course, this metadata is uh, written from the perspective of end users, like science researchers. So there's a lot of um, moving forward this effort of trying to get um, different stakeholders, like um, data management centers and also vendors to contribute to the metadata structure. So the next step is also trying to integrate metadata to actual usable form. So um, first is to publish the GitHub to enable community discussion and feedback. Second is to provide example templates and wrapper Python scripts for publishing metadata. And then the whole aim here will be to reduce the overhead for data providers like you all, and also to minimize uh, different uh, parameters which are very, uh, vendor specific. And then uh, Andres touched on this a little bit. There's a suggestion for this campaign. And I think this campaign is wonderful as a, in a way that sort of really forces us to come up with a common, uh, a simplified common data standard as a start. And then um, so um, our group is keen for, for receiving feedback and suggestions. Here are our emails. Uh, feel free to email us. So that's all. <clears throat> yes, thanks, Boon. So um, I, the idea there is that the metadata is stored at uh, with the data, but in a single single uh, separate file, and each uh, data file then has uh, kind of the the minimum number of of, of header information. But the metadata is not stored in in each and every file repeatedly, so this is uh, does not affect the way the data is then or the data format is shared. Um, in the chat, while we were uh, while Wun was presenting, Andres uh, Chevaria from Optasense asked whether there is already um, any any converters to. Uh, to data formats from from different uh, units uh, or from different manufacturers, the answer is no. But uh, it should be quite easy to to write a writer with the once the once we have decided on the on the final output. Just because it is just five header values and a uh, and an array of uh, floats that defines the, the trace data. So, and whenever you read in your data in a Python or MATLAB or C, whatever, you can then write it uh, with uh, HDF writer. Um, so, yes, but uh, I agree it would be good that if somebody uh, prepares a exporter for a specific manufacturer that this can then also be, be shared um that might be a good question for andres whether or not uh vendors were willing to kind of uh get on board and contribute such uh such converters i mean we know that we have uh hdf5 and tdms readers for like Celixa. i'm sure there's something equivalent for optisense so would that be something optisense might consider Oh, sorry, he can't, he's muted. Sorry, yeah, we can't have a discussion. <laughs> Maybe just answer in the chat. No, we can. Um, if they, uh, sorry, who who are we unmuting? If they raise their hand, I can, I can unmute and promote people. 
Okay. He said, uh, yeah, I can check with the software team. So. Uh, another question is, uh, would you prioritize deployments in novel locations or less exciting locations, uh, but with better coupling? Um, yeah, I think that so we, we are happy about every, every contribution. I think what we are missing right now is installations in Asia and uh, South America and Africa. Um, but every, every contribution is, uh, is very, very welcome. So um, yes, I think that's, we, we don't have any preference there. And um, question on the questionnaire. I think uh, Casey, you posted that already in the in the chat or somewhere. Yes. So there's um, the form for collecting information about contributing systems is in the chat. Great. Thank you. Um, so yes, please uh, fill out that that chat or, or that you know, that form. Uh, as soon as possible, but before February 1st. Um, like the earlier we know uh, about the, the expected uh, contributions and the expected data size at all, then we can uh, adjust earlier on. So, but if, if you think you can contribute, um, also there's a question on whether that contribution is already confirmed or just tentative. So that's one of the questions. So uh, that was also helpful. If you have ideas already, but just need confirmation from some participants or from some stakeholders, just indicate that this contribution is tentative. Um, and question from Martin Schoenball, uh, whether there is uh, matchmaking. So People have interrogators, but no cables, and uh, the other way around. People have cables, but no interrogators. That is a very good question. And um, I don't think there's an organized way of doing that. Um, and I can't think of a good organized way of doing that. I think there will be more cables than interrogators. So. I guess a better way is if anybody with interrogators, I don't know. And maybe you can also put that in the forms. There's a free text. Yeah, just fill out the forms. Uh, there's a free text comment. So then you can fill in that you have a cable, but no interrogator. And if you have an interrogator, then put in zero length kilometer, and then I will know then I can, can coordinate that. That seems to be a good way. Um, is there anything else? Any questions that we might have missed? Um, yes, there's another comment from Manfred that the secondary objective could be to develop a framework towards uh, real-time sharing and analysis. Uh, and he acknowledges that this is a technological challenge. Uh, and uh, I agree that this is uh, indeed the idea that we just find out the bottlenecks of how this could be done then in the next five years, maybe as a real-time data sharing, streaming, whatever option, and just finding out where the bottlenecks are towards that. So that's why we have just one month of data first to just get a feeling for what would actually the data be? What are, where are the challenges? So if there aren't any more questions here that I see in the chat. Um, I think there's a question about um, yeah. communication. So yes, I think there's a suggestion to use a Slack channel for this. Um, I think we're, we're trying to figure out the best approach to coordination. So whether it's Slack, GitHub, email list. Yes, we agree. I there. second Slack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a bit uh, against any Teams or Slack or whatever, because it inherently excludes people who are 
on their company or university on a different system and then yet another system that another they have to monitor so me personally i'm old school with email lists that's rather um technological agnostic uh, anybody can can access that but uh, we will we will discuss that also during during october andre um, I, i'm wondering if it might be possible to have some kind of informal get together of the global gas month interests to people at AGU uh, in December. Sure, I won't be there, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will be there. Um, so maybe maybe you, Herb, want to coordinate that? Uh, okay. This as part of a session or something? Okay, if there's interest, uh, then just something informal to touch base a month and a half before the uh, campaign begins. Um, Looks like we have a raised yes. hand from Andres. Yes. And Andres. Hi, everyone. This is Andres Chavaria from OptoSense. Uh, we have uh, some interrogators. I'm I'm, you know, I'm, my background is seismology, so I, I'm very encouraged about this effort. Uh, so Andreas uh, may, may not, we may have access to, to some fibers, again, that we can provide interrogators, may not be the newest, longest range, but we, th there may be opportunities there. So uh, make sure that you, at least my contact is there and uh, we, we can try to coordinate. Uh, and again, we'll try, I'll try, we'll try to support it as much as we can. And the other comment that I have is we have data in, in many installations, mostly in wells, uh, which traditionally seismologists will not have that data. So I'm curious, I, I already checked with a couple of uh, operators, they don't want coordinates released. So in those, if we were to shift the, let's say the well coordinates, how much can we shift them so that they're still suitable for global uh, seismology issues? Yeah. Just, just a question out there again. If I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to put Vogus numbers on coordinates, but I, I already know that they won't release a, a exact wellhead coordinates. So if we were to shift them to put Vogus numbers, would it still capture? I think what's important is capturing the geometries, particularly when you have vertical and horizontal wells uh, i would like i would like to have some value out of that of data of a data like that is is 100 meters too too little yeah i think it probably has to be outside of the block of the, where the operator is is working so maybe a few kilometers and then we probably get again into i mean then then we have bogus data as you okay so yeah. something to think about again because there is there's definitely a lot of yeah. uh, right now permanent installations uh, that have that type of data so it would be definitely good yeah a good question let uh let me think about that also in the, in the team internally um also, there's actually also Vincent Lantic from Phoebus Optics also uh, mentioned that they have uh, would have uh, a few interrogators available uh, for for these kind of purposes. Uh, I think uh, Vincent, uh, they just should reach out to you then directly um, and uh, figure out the terms and conditions. Uh, so that's that's great, Vincent. Thanks. Um, Andreas, maybe we should have a separate email list uh, just for the vendors to discuss the converters and potential free interrogators, since that's something which a couple of different vendors, maybe some who aren't on today, might might be interested in participating in. Sure. Yeah. We can indeed do that. Um,
So Uh, Carlo Giocini says that uh, they have a broadband borehole seismometer, 250 meter deep. Uh, the well is wired with a vertical fiber cable available. It sounds like they don't have an interrogator there. So, um, it, I mean, I think uh, all, all the borehole installations are very interesting. And especially if you have a broadband uh, seism a seismometer there uh, that's even even better also for transfer functions and so forth so um, yes I think uh, maybe if you can reach out to um, yeah if you can reach out to some of the vendors or uh, just reach out to me again we can certainly find out uh, he is in Sardinia or that that borehole is in Sardinia. Um, yes, Vincent just confirmed uh, people can contact him and he's also very interested in the uh, data format. Uh, and Nate Lin, sorry, Nate uh, Lindsay uh, wrote a comment that Globus apparently supports an API for data transfer, but he has no um, hasn't seen any documentation on authentica authentication. Um, I don't think anybody has done that on the pub does, um, but um, these is, uh, this is a good question and uh, we can certainly uh, ad address that. So data automatically uploaded, but please remember, uh, we want downsampled data uploaded. Don't uh, use the uh, full range uh, data set. We might have to monitor also the pub does uh, in the beginning when once first data come in and uh, remove then data that doesn't fit the specifications. Um, is there any, like we have five minutes left. Are there any comments on the uh, 24 hour recording idea so for that's mostly for ambient noise but also other uh, data sets it will be interesting to have that i would suggest to do that just in the middle of the month which would be let's say on the 14th then which is a tuesday so just after the weekend people can set things up uh, out of randomness and we have then two weeks of experience already so uh, again, this is purely voluntarily if you don't have uh, the data available there, but it would be interesting to have dust data from around the world continuously for ambient noise or whatever. I'm sure there will be a lot of PhD and master students jumping on, the, on this. Nate? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna take up on something that Andreas was, um, Andreas Traviere was picking up on, which is, I think we might pick up a lot more data if the location wasn't so strictly enforced. And maybe there's a subset of data sets that could then be without locations. And that would provide an opportunity for folks to work on detection um, without something like imaging as a focus of the, of the project. Um, just, a, just a comment, I guess. Sure. So you mean not for earthquake location per se, but just for having access to a data set that contains earthquakes? Yeah, I think there's a number of there's a number of possible applications that this type of a effort opens up, right? Everything from data transfer, like you were saying, to detection, array response, beam forming, you know, not just for the purpose of global seismology. And so we don't necessarily need locations on the planet to do that. So there could be a subset of, of data sets that are not perfectly located. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm just nervous that you're not going to get as much data. Out of curiosity, Nate, what do you think the uncertainty, which, for example, a marine cable owner would accept as the kind of the dithering in uh, coordinates? 
they, they would be, un it's, a, it's a probably a continuous spectrum, but they're probably uncomfortable with releasing the location of the cable. Um, mm -hmm. To, uh, yeah, we could probably ask for several kilometers shifting. Um, but I, I'm just saying that like a relative, you know, a, an inner array coordinate system is all you really need. Right? In, intra, intra array coordinates are really all you need for certain problems. But not for the array of array where you need sure, the exact sure, sure. I, I would say, you know, yeah, you could definitely have a lot of the data sets coming in with perfect locations and those would just be documented. But you're gonna you're gonna restrict the the um, possible data collection from from industry in particular. You know you can't release a thousand kilometer pipeline um, with its location. Yeah, and that's exactly I guess uh, what what this uh, effort is about to find out what is everybody's comfort zone with that. And I I guess also actually if you're really smart and have a good Earth model, then you could uh invert for the cable location because you know the timing and so the geometry well, that's <laughs> yeah uh well <laughs> that's not going to be very helpful <laughs> you know <laughs> got to be very careful about this right I, i'd like to make a comment about the uh, metadata i really enjoyed uh hearing boone's overview on the readme file I'm wondering if you're contemplating a template uh, like a spreadsheet uh, for putting the basics of those different metadata uh, uh, entries so that one could say quickly move through all the different arrays and, and just get a feeling for uh, the, the type and uh, uh, formats of their arrays. Uh, so yes, we have an Excel version of the template. Mm -hmm. And then we also want to have a different, just like a Python script to read and indexing. So those are in progress. And I think the main key for this kind of indexing is that all the attribute has to have us, you have to have the same name for all these like channel length, they're all the same name. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, so uh, thanks everyone. One, I hope uh, some of the questions have been addressed. And uh, as you all hear, there's still a lot of open questions as well. Uh, interesting uh, feedback. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. We will be, we will keep on working on that. Uh, and for the time being, I think uh, updates will be further sent out to the DAS RCN mailing list if there is any uh, update on the format and the metadata. And then <clears throat> uh, based on the feedback I get on the, on the uh, questionnaire, and once we get closer to February, we will uh, send then out emails to those who have signed up using the, using the form. Um, but we will also post that further on, uh, I guess, on, on websites. So please be patient. There's not uh, uh, the perfect solution yet ready there, but we will get there for February. And um, yes, thanks everyone. All right, thanks so much, Andreas, Boone, everyone who is participating. Uh, the recording will be made available on the IRIS Earthquake Science uh, playlist. If you're interested in future DAS webinars, please join the mailing list and check out our DAS RCN website. Thanks so much for joining.